Welcome everyone. I see a few folks connecting to audio, so we'll give everyone a few seconds to get settled. All right. Welcome to another Nashua Johnson and Johnson capacity building series. As a part of our health, our race to health equity, we have uh, asked our CHW leaders to come in and present on their specialties. Today, it is my honor to introduce Dean Jones. Hello, everybody. I'm Dean Jones. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here, and it's an honor to be here on this platform working um, in adjacent with the NATRA to make sure that the CHW message is being moved forward throughout the United States and beyond. Hello, everybody. Hi, Dean. Let me go ahead and give folks a little background. Mr. Jones is a longtime Hartford resident and youth advocate. He is the former Compass Youth Collaborative Peace Builders Director. He is currently the Chief Visionary Officer for the organization Hoop Wave Sports Mentoring Program. His passion for serving the community stems from firsthand knowledge of community needs. I grew up in Hartford and attended Martin Luther King Elementary, Fox Middle School, and Weaver High School. Dean got into the street and gang life at the age of 13. By the age of 23, he found himself serving time for a drug conviction. I just realized that something had to give. I didn't want to live this lifestyle and I knew I was capable of doing something positive. In 2005, recently released and looking to make a difference, Dean became a volunteer for OPP AmeriCorps program. He later started his street outreach work for Hartford Communities That Care. He eventually found himself employed by Compass through an emerging program known as Compass Peace Builders. He spent his days managing a caseload of high risk youth while balancing a full course load at Springfield College and Boston Gordon Conwell Theological Institute. In May 2012, Dean graduated from Springfield College with a bachelor's degree in human services. He left Compass to pursue his master's in social work from the University of Connecticut in August 2012. Once I got that bachelor's degree, I didn't want to stop. It must have been divine intervention because I really wanted to go to UConn. And in May 2015, he graduated with his master's in social work. In 2016, he received an official pardon. He works as a social worker for My People Clinical Services from the years 2015 to 2017 and worked summers at Blue Hill Civic Associations. In addition, his passions for ministry led Dean to be ordained as a travel elder at Phillips Christians Methodist Apostle Church located in Hartford, Connecticut. Mr. Jones is the CVO of Hoop Wave Sports Mentoring. Hoop, Hoop stands for Hope, Opportunity, Obedience Equals Pride, a student athletic program which saves lives through the art of basketball. The program has assisted and helped over 2,500 youth since year 2009. Now I'll turn it over to Mr. Jones. Thank you. Hello, everybody, again. Um, let me just say that it's an honor and uh, privilege to be here before you. And I just want to go over this slide that's in front of you, the objective of today's um, session. Um, it, we're going to explore circumstances that propel youth into criminal behavior. We're going to discuss ways CHWs can intervene in the school to prison pipeline address mental health issues that are a result of youth incarceration, lack of family support in areas of 
of need that schools cannot support. And we're gonna look at providing strategies for successful youth career gateways, mentorships, education, and life skills. Those are, that's the, today's objectives. As we go into the next slide, um, I'm gonna give you a description of a young person. So you have this in your mind as we're rolling through these slides, all right? I worked with a 14-year-old who played on my basketball team. Um, I was also his social worker um, and worked with him daily on intervention and getting him back on track through redirection. He told me when I first met him at 14 that he either was going to play basketball or die in the streets. Um, at the age of eight, he was removed from his home. Age of 12, he was living on his own. And then his family was able to get, get right back to him. I mean, uh, re-engage with them after um, two years of tracking them down. At the age of 14, I, 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 I um, did an intervention with him and started working with him. Now, I gave you an overview of the story of a young man. Now, let me tell you what exactly this adolescence to mentorship piece entails. When, work, when I was working with that 14 year old, he was four people in one. He's not bipolar, four people in one. The first person was the young person who was eight years old who was removed. So every time he got in trouble or he had a um, uh, disagreement with somebody, he lashed out as an eight-year-old. Um, his educational uh, track stopped at the age of 12. So he was not proficient in school. Um, so he didn't really do the work or go to school or have a love or even passion for school. Um, and then he was 14 years old. So he was who he was in his original state. But socially, he was 20, probably 21, 22 years old because he can engage in the conversation with you. He can um, talk to you about life and choices and, and um, obstacles and how he can overcome and even how he can use the system that best help him. This was all happening at the age of 14. And he was a part of a gang street crew. And at the time he was living with his grandmother and didn't really have a strong relationship with his mother. So when you look at this chart in front of you, the Maslow hierarchy of needs, you look at the breakdown, and we know that a young person, you know, for the most part, or even people in, in a gang life, if you don't know, I'm sorry, they run by the same scale. They're looking for self actualization They're getting that when they're in the street life. The self-esteem, they're building up their street credibility, which gives them self-esteem, gives them an opportunity to feel like they're somebody. They have a sense of love and belonging. They feel love when they're part of something and belonging. They feel safe. Um, and all their basic needs are met. Air, water, food, shelter, sleep, clothing, and reproduction. So this part of their life is being met. When you think about it, and you, you should know that at the age of, um, at this particular age, that a family should be providing this for this young man or young people. And this is a lot of the reasons why gangs exist. If you take this chart and flip it um, upside down, you'll see exactly how this becomes a square and this is how they operate. When they're looking for the support or they're lashing out, it's because some of these needs are not being met. So when I'm working with a young person, I have to believe in their unbelief at all times. I have to believe in their unbelief so that they can have something to achieve and look forward to. You can go to the next slide. This image right here is an image that is powerful because a young person is conflicted with so many different thoughts daily. You have to think about it like this. A moment changes a second, a second changes an hour, an hour changes a day, a day changes a month, a month changes a year, a year changes a decade. So for one decision a young person makes can affect the decade, either alive or they'll be 
not here, dead and gone. And they have all of these different uh, items that you see in this picture going through their development, especially in the urban community. You see that the alcoholism, school, sports, flashy women, um, you got the, the gun, it could be an officer or it can be who they are, the, the heart, um, gangs, red and blue, um, the brain, money, and even religion. So all of these things are flowing through this young person's mind, depending on what type of development and who they're connected to. That's why it's important as CHWs to when we're dealing with a young person, we have to look at the whole person and have a clear picture of what they've gone through so we can help them where they're going to. Let me go to the next slide. What are some of the, you know, CSWs, what we can do? We can be role models, right? We have to be role models. We are the first caring adult in some people's lives. We're helping um, young people navigate systems. Think about this for a minute. According to the Education Week analysis, 69,782 students um, have been arrested yearly since the year 2013 to the year 2020 during uh, before uh, COVID. According to American Addiction to Juvenile Incarceration, nearly 60,000 youth are incarcerated daily throughout the United States. So we have a vivid, uh, we have a role we have to play in the lives of helping young people navigate systems or get on track or redirect even in their relapse. And when I say relapse, if they went through hell from ages one to 12, we can't expect Jesus 13, 14, and 15, and 16. If we're picking them up anywhere between the tracks of 12 and 13, 14, 15, 16, we have to help them reframe a different way of living. They have to have a sense of belonging. I showed you the, the Maslow hierarchy, and that is um, essential to just the basic necessities of their development. Go to the next slide. Hope Dylan. Um, this is a concept that I know um, some have heard, um, but I am a hope dealer, right? And we have to be hope dealers. And I hope in this word um, acronym that I have is having our positions edified. So when you're dealing with a young person and they're in transit and you're helping them transition, their position has, has to be edified, has to be uplifted, has to be motivated motivated so that they can make the different decisions when they're not with you. And that's a lot of what I do, right? So when I was in the role of a director of a street outreach program, I was able to connect with hundreds of young people daily and then educate the team on how to do the follow-up and follow-through work so that they can be um, sufficient and just brokering that relationship. That's the key, everybody that's on here right now relationship, right? You have to be able to broker that relationship. You have to build that bond. You have to be um, willing to put any bias or anything you have um, thoughts of to the side and look at the young person and operate with who they are at that moment. Because their moments, like I told you just a few minutes ago, can change a decade in their life. So we have to be a pivotal point if it's making them smile, encouraging them, pushing them through systems or anything, we have to make sure that we're pushing young people to the next steps in their life. Next slide, please. Let me read this purple box for you guys. Youth with mental health disorders are more likely to be unhappy at school, be absent, or be suspended or expelled. The learning is negatively impacted because of poor concentration, um, inability to retain information, poor peer relationships, and aggressive behaviors. This is very important, EQ versus IQ. The emotional intelligence of a young person versus the um, intelligence of a young person. This word E in emotions means energy in motion. So whatever energy 
a young person is, is giving or getting is they're putting that in motion. So when you're working with a young person and their energy has been disrupted into a negative way and, we're, and, and their paths and their motion at that particular moment is moving in a negative way, we have to reroute that. How do we do that? By being present. How do we do that? By being a role model. How do we do that? By being a hope dealer. How do we do that? To help a young person, uh, help a young person arrive at that moment of their IQ. It's very important that emotional uh, quotation of a person, the imbalance, the cognitive behavior, the way they think, the way they process is very key. Think about this for a moment. The amygdala, right? That holds the uh, memory bank in your brain. If it's disrupted or is, if it's not functioning right, whatever you have at that particular mind or combat it with, you will be in that fight, flight, or freeze mode. So young people are always in a constant uproar when the EQ, emotional intelligence of who they are is off course. That's why it's very essential um, as a community health worker to push uh, young people in a positive direction by helping them navigate systems, by helping them navigate themselves. Because reentry, the, the fancy word is like getting a personal job. But for me, when I was incarcerated, when I was in jail, the reentry was hearing my mother's voice during my one to 12 year old um, upbringing, hearing her tell me the right and wrong ways to live life. And then also having the support in the process of that. So reentry really, really means to reenter within self so you can push forward to move forward through different systems. So we have to help a young person get to that point of their life where they're accept, accepting themselves um, and able to move forward. Next slide. It's a, it takes progress, right? So with, when we're building, helping build a young person up, I want you to look to the right of this uh, chart. It says build empathy, right? That empathy part is key. And why is the empathy part is key? Because a lot of young people do not have that empathy. So through mentorship, through education, and when I say education, I'm not just talking about school, I'm talking about any interactions in their lives, life skills, youth career pathways, with a caring adult and a plan and understanding that there will be relapse, there will be relapse. There will be moments when they are going down and may choose a different route and you have to assist them to get back on track. You help them build this thing called empathy. And when they have this thing called empathy in their body, they're now, to, we're now ready to assist and help someone else or make better choices for themselves. And that's the ultimate goal. How do we build empathy through this process of building a young person with all that they're faced with? Um, I, I'm, I'm big right now, and it was really um, on my plate that I'm really thinking about is the, the, the second grader right now, who was, their first day of school was on a computer two years ago. If the prison pipeline, if they're saying the school to prison pipeline, if by the third grade, if the reason the educational level is low, they already know how many prison beds they have available. What's, what's happening with the, 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 the second grader right now who didn't even walk into a classroom, who, who, who are now in the classroom and may not even have the social skills to adapt to um, any type of structure because they may have, may have gotten the education or may have not gotten that education, nor social skills, because the parent at that particular moment could have been single, could have been a parent, two-parent household, could have been a grandparent, could have been adopted, could have just a lot of different variables. So I'm, I'm really big. I'm, I'm thinking about the second grade huge because I know it's going to affect our economy. Um, because if you don't, if, if you realize that our economy is um, people, it's based off of our existence. So if the second grader rationale or understanding or functions and off and going into the third grade and they're given these tests to measure out to see where they're at, 
on the IQ side and the EQ hasn't been met, then we're going to, you know, be faced with a deficit. Here in Connecticut, we have um, a gap. Um, the suburban towns, they receive about $700 million a year towards education. Urban communities get receive about $400 million. I'm working with a group right now to help get that $250 million, $300 million to close that gap. Now think about this. Minority people have always, right, and this is urban communities, or however you want to, however you want to um, base it, have always have gotten an amendment to do things. So I think it's definitely injustice that there's a $300 million gap in the educational system right now. And I'm working with a group that's working with pushing um, lobbying to get this money to the district so they can do after, scare, after school, in school um, care for our students to have a better education. Right now, I'm gonna open the floor if you guys have any questions for me. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Uh, Mr. Jones, thank you. That was a very clear, precise presentation. I really appreciate it. My question to you is, is there a difference between male and female um, in terms of some of the situations or problem that you shared with us? Um, because I could, it could fluctuate, you know, where the female could be seen as the mother role, meaning like mm -hmm. if there's additional children, she's taking care of that, mm -hmm. um, taking care of the family where um, the young man's story that you shared with us, where he is pretty much on the street, it's different. It's himself that he's taking care of. I don't know if you want to talk about that just a little bit. Yes. And the young man that I was talking about, he was murdered at the age of 15. So he only lived one year after we started the engagement. Oh, mine. Yeah. So what I showed you was that was a real story. Um, and he, he told me he was either going to play basketball or die in the streets. And he did both. Um, and yes, there is a, there, the difference now is with uh, the young ladies. I know if, you, if you're on social media, you're watching the trends and things like that, um, the women, the young women um, are. To me, the bottom line is women are like the backbone of America, if you ask me, right? The birth canal, everything. So in the, in the culture of the Muslim culture, say a nation can only rise, rise uh, as high as a woman. So if a woman is accepting anything, then a man can do anything, right? So now we have an imbalance with our younger women who need that more, um, they need more guidance, right? because the young man is like flowing off the energy of the young woman. And, um, and I, just, I just know for a fact that women um, are highly intelligent and they are the mobilizers of, of, of all things, right? And they bring, uh, um, they bring life into this world. So we just gotta get a hold of our young ladies and, and just keep you know, build them, building them up. Do I have a number right now that says what's the difference between the male and the female? No, I don't have a number. But those numbers that I gave you, that was an inclusive in man and female. And there's been a lot of um, incarceration recently with young women. You got to think, in, eight, in um, 1918, there was no prisons for women. None. Right now, you, you have several across America. What, what took place from then to now, right? And that's, that's how we gotta look at it. How do we disrupt that? How do we keep educating? How do we keep pushing? Thank you for the question. Hi, Dean, we have another question in the chat. Okay. Uh, Sherry Brown, she says, how do you reach a child with dyslexia who loves school, but acts out because he tries hard and has difficulty? Doctors request an IEP, but the school only wants to provide special accommodations. Any advice? Well, yeah, you have to push the school. 
um, the IEP is, is, is law, right? The IEP governs the, the autonomy of the student. And if the, the dyslexia just means that they're reading, you know, they see things differently. So how do you put this young person in position to see things the way he sees things and not um, push them into a direction or where they're not, you know, retaining information or even can participate? So when a No Child Left Behind Act um, came in 1994, uh, whenever it came about, um, I, I think that did a little harm because it affected the dyslexia young person because it included, put everybody in one classroom and said, well, the student who was reading or on or accurate in this particular subject would help the kid who had issues, right? And that wasn't the case. It reversed because a young person who needs more support needs more peer support. I mean, you know, more um, su support by like a peer uh, tutor or mentor in the classroom to assist them and help them see the, their world clearly. Now, when you put them in a, in a room of 30 and you got, you know, six or seven young people who need like more engagement, it is, it's gonna, the chemistry of teaching is gonna be totally different. So we have to revisit that too, on, as, a, as, you know, as a national approach of how do we get our young people like with dyslexia or any IEPs, um, better equality education, because they may, they see the world differently. And it's okay to see the world differently because we're all different. And they're gonna arrive at their way of learning um, at, a different, at different times of their development. So how do we do that, right? We gotta, we gotta look at that, um, look at this approach holistically. And I believe that's why Nashua is in the, in the lane that they're in because they're able to put together um, um, this type of platform and so that we can, um, as a team, and I'm saying collectively, wherever you're at on this on this call, on the Zoom call, we collectively um, come together and stay connected to see how we can push the agenda to push a lot of the stuff that we're um, talking about through these webinars. Absolutely. DHWs are excellent advocates and that's um, a perfect practice of um, advocating for a child in need. Yes. Yeah, despite what, you know, the school may have, you know, that's, that's a big thing. Also, um, do you want to kind of talk about how uh, the needs of youth need to still be uh, client centered, even though they're under age and some people think that they don't have rights? Oh, they have all the rights in the world, right? They, um, client centered, they definitely need to be, um, How can I put this right way? They need to be supported, right? Um, and we they need to have the structures and systems in place to support that young that young person. Um, and I believe CHW is just being one gateway. MSWs, um, you got VPPs, whatever pathway that young person is in and needs support there has to be a system that helps them navigate that process. So the relationships between the entities have to come together and the relationship of that young person who needs the support at that moment, wherever they're at. If they're shot, then you have a support system. If you're struggling in school, you have a support system. If you need after school program, you have a support system. If you have an IEP, you need a support system. So all of these different systems, um, have to be working for the betterment uh, of a young person. And that's my take on it. Absolutely. Sounds like some wraparound services. 100%. Go ahead, Denise. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Brother Dean, welcome. Thank you so much. You. Um, it's been an incredible 30 minutes so far, and I'm, I'm so glad that I could. Uh, clear my schedule because I didn't want to miss the education. Um, full transparency, I've had an opportunity to watch from afar um, and in closer proximity than some to the work of Brother Dean, um, including as close as uh, engaging of my three sons in Hartford, Connecticut. I have two questions for you because I, I do consider you an OG from lived experience and mm -hmm. also from practice. Yeah. Um, the first question, 
because I'm sure there are a lot of practitioners on here who are thinking about uh, interventions, right? Mm -hmm. Certain interventions get funded and whatever gets funded is what gets pushed into our states and into our nonprofits. And so mm -hmm. a lot of us who are CHWs, we move from you know, role to role based on mm -hmm. the intervention designed mm -hmm. by some researchers. You've done a lot of these interventions from the peace yeah. builders to the play intervention, right? Can you just talk to us about what it's like to take an intervention and adapt it? In other words, to be client-centered, as Michaela talked about, and also how people on this call who are practitioners should set aside the intervention if it's not serving the needs of youth. How do you know when that happens, right? How can we improve what we think is going to work from what is actually going to work? All right, speaking from experience, uh, speaking from my standpoint, it's just when I'm when I deal with a young person, I'm dealing with them. Like I said, I I can't have no judgment, no bias, nothing when I'm working with a young person. I have to be very clear on that. Like there has to be a clear line on that. And if I'm using CBT, cognitive behavioral theory, or therapy, or if I'm using a play. Was dealing with that, you know, the bottom line to all of it is slowing that young person down at that moment to get to who they are, to get to the point of where they're going, right? So when you look at every, um, you look at RAD, right? right? Um, that uh, adaptive disorder, you know, you look at all these different disorders and that DSM-5 and, um, cross-referencing to work that's being done on the CHW level, we're trying to slow down the process of that young person because their world is spinning, right? Um, so how do you practically look at that um, if it's not working? I mean, how do you know if it's not working? That should be the first question, right? What, what, what are you putting in for it not to work? I remember doing a session with a young person, the three sessions, I, they said nothing. So I said, hello, how you doing? My name is Dan. And they looked at me, and they, my name is, and they said nothing. And I gave them that space to say nothing. By them saying nothing said a lot. Who are you, right? You gotta look at how Indians looked at it when they had the restorative circle. It was introduction, and then from introduction, you went to the trust. From the trust, you go to problem solving. From problem solving, you go to solutions. What usually happens is we go to introduction to problem solving. We miss the trust piece. We go from introductions to solutions, and we miss the problem solving, which is the elephant in the room, and the trust piece, which is the elephant in the room. So you have to look at that restorative circle and see how do you start with the introduction of who you are and laying out the uh, playing field of building trust with that, that particular individual. And I'm not saying you got to disclose your life history or anything like that. I'm saying, how do you, what is the common ground? I, I did a restorative circle yesterday at Weaver High School. And the common ground was I played football, they played football. So when we all felt, we all knew we played football, it was like, it was a smile, right? They was like, oh, well, for real, what, what position? So. I went on for about three to four minutes talking about my position, my experiences and how they feel, you know. So it helped smooth out when we went right to the problem, right after that. So we have to look at the work on, I believe on those four lenses, like the introduction piece, like who are you, why are you there? What's your purpose? They know why you're there. Are you a caring adult? Are you someone that's intervening at that particular moment or supporting them in a preventive way? Um, and then moving into building that trust, going into the problem solving and the solutions. You can't skip the cycles of how we build. And if you do this, even in your meetings, a real good meeting has an introduction of trust, um, a cycle of problem solving and going to solutions. And that's how we have to look at this. And that's how you know when you're getting the breakthrough, when a young person starts to, you know, unwrap or, reveal to you what's happening. 
and you're not really pushing or pulling to get it. It's like it's becoming natural. So you're probing and asking those open-ended questions to get back more feedback and have them build up that sense of um, belonging, right? So they can unpack with you, so you can help them, um, you know, heal. And we have to be safe targets, right? Safe targets. Like, you can cuss me out. You can cuss me out. I'm not going to personalize it because whatever happened to you before you got to me, I'm just, you're just unpacking on me. I can't go there with you. Who are you talking to? I'm an adult. I don't even, I just look at them. So when you're going high, I go low. And that, and the Bible says it's like putting a, a, a hot coal on the head and it starts. So when you don't, if you go high with them, then it's, it's going to be like, like two bucks. When you go low, they have to come down eventually because you're not participating in that energy and you're changing the energy at that particular moment. So that's how we have to look at the work as a practitioner. That's how we have to look at the work when we're doing intervention. And that's how we have to view the work when we're working with young people. We're slowing whatever's happening in their life down at that moment and having them hone in on who they are and why we're here. And let's get to to, you know, and the solution may not be the first session, second, third, fourth, fifth. It can be 30 years from now. I mean, I know practitioners have sessions, they have, you know, if it's 10 sessions, but I'm just saying in, in general, all this stuff, you know, happens at, at, at different times in their development. And some order and some seed and an increase will happen. It, will, it has to happen. It's just written. Such a comprehensive answer. I just want to thank you so much. I want to thank you for your service to our community, uh, to my community. I know we have other questions. So Michaela, I hand it back to you. Yes, that was so beautifully said. Thank you. I completely agree, Dean. Um, when, when you're in the room with youth and they've been shut out for a long mm -hmm. period of time, and sometimes all of their emotions, aggression, frustrations from the people who were closest to them come out on you. And, and it's okay because we've been, we, we have that lived experience, right? So we're, yeah. if, if we were them, we don't blame yeah. them. So we know exactly where they're coming from and we know exactly how to just listen and wait till they're done and just take that pause. And then, you know, like you said, go, if you're going high, you go low. And then you just kind of mm -hmm. find the soft spot to go in and make your, make your point of intervention. Uh, so we do have a couple questions in the chat. So Andre okay. wants to know, how do we get school, community and juvenile detention centers buy in and educate on these practices about the ACEs for instance? So Forms. Yeah, so ACEs is good when it comes to identifying, right? And helping them um, point to where a young person is on the spectrum. But pointing to where a young person is on a spectrum to practice is two different things, right? We have identified that this is happening and we've identified that, but now how do we put all that in practice with the school, juvenile um, and court system? Um, and I, I think it starts here. I think it starts with having that, um, let's say, um, that incredible message when we're putting it together, um, um, to the lawmakers to say, hey, this is what's happening. And it can start as, as, as simple as, you know, reaching out to them and, and having them help identify, you know, different practices that support a young person. So the ACEs is important. It's very important. So any other, was there other question? You're on mute. Hey, Brother Dean, I think maybe she's not able to hear us right now. So let me oh. just lift up the other question. So um, we have two, one from Barbara, 
it's a statement. And then she says, any suggestions? Mm -hmm. She says, I think a major part is to teach adults working with you how to respond to the youth. What are mm -hmm. the suggestions for people who come to this work through their academic pathway? They may not have lived experience. They may not have any children, right? Mm -hmm. There are a number of um, opportunities to engage youth that maybe haven't been a part of their experience, except from an academic, right? And sort of a professional development perspective. What are your, what are your thoughts on how to prepare them? Passion. What's your passion? What's your purpose? What's your reason? Why do you exist? Why have you chosen this field? This field, you're not making a million dollars. You know, you're, you're not going to, you know, <laughs> this field right here is straight up building people. This is a people building. We are the social sales. You know how the, they got Navy sales? We are the social sales for people. We're going in to dig deep, right? Um, so I, if you don't have any children, you have a childhood experience. Pull from your childhood experience. The courageousness of a person speaks value, right? Marvin King says that the universe is on the side of justice. So we have to be on the side of justice, no matter where we come from, no matter what background we have, so that this young person can have an equivalent life that's, um, um, that qualifies them to be supportive in any action, way, or deed in their development. We have to. That's just, if you're, if you're, if you're in this work, because this work will challenge you, right? It's challenging. Um, I ask myself, uh, a young person gets killed, dad, what could I have done different? You know, I, I, I go back and I, I resume and I look back and, I, and, I, and at the end of the day, I say, you know what? I did everything. And it's, it's a process of saying, I did everything I could at that moment, something happened to make that moment a little different where this person lost their life. And I'm, I, I went to the extreme, but just on a, on, a, on a student, you know, embodying that relationship of confronting that energy is basically being present. That word is powerful. Are you present? Or at present at Christmas, it's like you're giving somebody something. So what are you giving the world? What are you giving the field? What are you giving this young person? What presence are you having? How you, what, what do you, what do you, when you come to the table, what's your purpose? What's your reason of being at the table with anybody, right? So this work is, is not for the faint and it's not to be rich. It's to save lives, it's to be a social cell and it's just to keep being, getting better and getting better and getting better. Um, uh, you know, I, I believe that's what it is. I mean, they, they, they do say shoot for the moon so you can land with the stars. Let's just keep shooting for the moon. Absolutely. As long as we keep going. Uh, keep we going. do have a, a hand up from Maureen. Uh, so before we hear from her, I would like everyone to just start thinking um, if you're comfortable to please share with us the role that you play with working with youth. Um, and you can put that in the chat or come off mute and what kind of supports uh, they might need to further your work, um, including toolkits, one pagers, mentoring, things like that. So I'm gonna challenge you guys to take on that question. And Maureen, if you could come off mute for your question. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, so first of all, thank you for such a really great presentation. Um, mm -hmm. And for myself, in my work as a CHW, um, I don't have that much interaction with young people. I'm really mm -hmm. serving older adults, mm -hmm. um, but I'm very interested in the topic as a parent um, mm -hmm. and as someone who has been benefited from mentorship. <laughs> um, I got to thinking when someone was talking about ACEs, um, and I loved when you talked about being a safe space um, for people to, you know, unload on you and, and all of that. But it also got me thinking that in terms of, um, you know, schools, especially how mm -hmm. youth are dealing with so much trauma um, mm -hmm. and sometimes they're triggered and they have reactions um, that are, you know, viewed as like disciplinary issues, or criminalized, but it's a normal, you know, response mm -hmm. to trauma. 
My question is, I recently learned about a approach uh, called community resiliency model that teaches mm. um, nervous system self-regulation. Um, and I was taught this model and said that it could be used with children as young as three. Um, so I was curious if you had ever come across that or if you had ever used it. I'm writing it down as we're speaking. I haven't, but I can almost promise you that I have indirectly <laughs> uh, did some community resilience and, um, with the, it, some shape, form, and fashion. But no, I haven't. And I'm writing it down. So I'm looking it up um, right after we meet. I'm going to put this in my tube belt. Um, um, and and, and what, what, so what, overall, just give me a nutshell. What are they talking about in that model? Um, so the model, I think, was created by Trauma Resource Institute, um, and I recently they had a 40-hour training specifically for CHWs, um, and the model, I think, you know, it's based on science um, that, you know, trauma impacts the brain, but so too can healing, you know, and if you practice these skills, you can form new connections um, in the brain, but basically it teaches that everyone kind of has an okay zone. And when you're in that zone, um, you have ups and downs, but you're still able to show up as your best self. Um, but when you get bumped out of that zone, which of course could take different things for different people, could be something that I view as small that might bump you know, my, my child out of their zone, um, that's when people can't really show up as their best self. So it has a lot of, to do with tracking your sensations and your nervous system, and then using these different tools uh, to kind of lean into pleasant sensations. Wow. Okay. Good. I'm, I'm definitely gonna look in, look into that. Thank you for that. And um, thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Maureen. I was glad to hear your voice come on uh, mute right now. I was like, "That's our Maureen." <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. I'm sorry. I'm not sure who came. Who had their hand up first? Uh, Stephanie, go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, my name is June Buck. Stephanie's right here. There's a group of us from SFCHC, and um, we just started yesterday as community health workers. Um, in addition to being a community health worker with SFCHC, I work with Parent Voices, and I used to work with youth incarcerated. So I work with youth, children, and teenagers currently um, through advocacy work as well as the school. And my experience is what is happening is we have children and youth with extreme PTSD. And mm -hmm. so with that being said, um, yep. I know that we need more teachers and child care providers, mm -hmm. early child educators who are trained more in trauma and how to incorporate that with the curriculum to help children. When there's an emotional block, a child cannot learn, right? Mm -hmm. So with that being said, I know there's curriculum called Onion Head that helps children. Um, foster their emotional intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. And their critical thinking skills. So I'm all about brain development. Um, I'm a child that comes from trauma as well. And I want to know if you knew any other curriculums out there that are around um, focusing on building on emotional intelligence, building on coping skills um, to deal with trauma, to deal specifically with PTSD. Um, in my neighborhood, we just had a shooting. There's a youngster in critical condition right now. Um, a few weeks before that, one of my sons came home with a gun. Um, this is reality, what I deal with. And so with that being said, you know, what can, what other curriculum suggestions you have? Like, like I said, I know of Onion Head, um, but I know there's a few other ones out there. And if you had any other suggestions um, around just building on that resilience and that emotional intelligence, thank you. So I know this agency in um, Boston, it's called ROCA. Boston is an agency in Boston, R-O-C-A, -R yep. And they have a CBT model that's tough, that deals with cognitive behavior therapy. Um, um, and that's, that's real good. That's one model. You can look at the agency and look at the model and it, it'll give you like a breakdown of everything that they're doing um, when it comes to that trauma informed 
that a trauma informed work. And then you also have this other model called Play, which uh, Denise Smith, she's tapped on it, um, which we learned in New Mexico. And Play is a model that deals with a young person who need, it's like a two minute slowdown, like how do you slow them down and re-engage them? So it's called Play, P-L-A-Y. Why? Yep. That's from out of Washington, D.C., correct, Miss uh, Denise? Yep, that's from out of D.C. Um, but there's a lot of different uh, models. Um, and then you and then you also, when you're explaining the trauma to somebody, you can use your hand. So you've seen that, right? So this is the brain. Inside the brain, right, is the amygdala, the thing that, that wiggles around. This is the stem, right? This is the stem to the brain. So when the brain isn't closed and it's like this, it's like this, fight, flight, freeze, fight, flight, freeze. We're trying to get them to close the brain so we can process the, pro, the, the, the op, you know, pro, help them process. But if any trauma happens, this is what happens. Fight, flight, freeze, fight, flight, freeze. And just think if a young person is, is living like this daily, what are their reactions to any trauma, to any anything that can trigger them. They're going to be triggered at a high level. That's why I always go low and I, I listen, I'm observing. And people say, Dean, why are you not talking? Because I'm listening. <laughs> That's why I'm not talking because I got to listen first and then I got to respond. I'm not, I'm going to give you a quick response because sometimes quick responses are not good responses. Yep, so you have to look at it in that way. And then you also got the other uh, PS, uh, post-traumatic post slave disorder. Right, so you got some stuff, and you, you got this thing in your body called the mitochondria. It's a cell within your body that's passed down from generation to generation. The mitochondria stores so many memories and um, so much stuff that sometimes you can be acting like your great, 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 great grandfather. You get stuff passed down, and it's through the cells, and it's genetics, right? So genetically, how you approach, you know, it's it's so many ways. What I will tell you is that don't ever stop with the process of working with a young person. It's been times young people cut me off. Oh, I'm done with you, Dan. Right? Okay, cool. I pick up your other three friends. Oh, I'm dealing, you know, we're dealing with in this different direction because as a community health worker, you're dealing with so many different variety. You know, you're working, you say you're working with parents, stages, people will cut you off because they just don't like the information you're giving them. And that's okay. Again, we're safe targets. We have to be okay with that. And then they'll come back around to you. And that's another thing that we have to realize. Again, if we're slowing everything down, even adults, give them space, right? To re-engage or engage in the process so that they can have the um, right amount of um, opportunity to even work and be productive in whatever they're trying to help from. Because everybody says hurt people, hurt people. But guess what? Hell people, hell people. So I'm a hell person now. So I'm going around laying my healing everywhere, right? So I got to be, I'm a healer. Like, you know what I'm saying? And I believe that. So my energy going into the room is going to change regardless. I don't care who you are. Hell people, hell people, right? We always got the notion and hurt people, hurt people. Yes, we understand. We get it. But hell people, hell people too. I just love what you just said. Thank you so much because what you spoke to was ancestral trauma that gets mm -hmm. embedded in our DNA and that does get passed on. And I love mm -hmm. how you said healing people, heal people, because mm -hmm. I always say hurting people, hurt people, but I really love the fact you do it. Thank you so much for your information and your wisdom. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Stephanie and crew for your question. That was a great conversation. Thank you, Dean, for answering that. And I just wanted to uh, ask uh, Natalie, Natalie, if you wanted to voice over your question uh, as the final question for today. Um, are you Natalie Bazil or is this yes. somebody else? Yes, I believe I saw your hand up. Oh, um, perhaps I put it down, but because um, I wanted somebody else to speak. I'm sorry, I asked the question earlier. Um, I just wanted to also share um, recently, you know, I know there's meditation and other various things, but there's mm. EFT, which is like tapping is another mm. thing that, um, you know, I feel like youth sometimes, you know, they don't want to like meditate or take a deep breath or whatever, because you know, they may not look cool or, you know, 
whatever it is, like having like discrete like um, techniques like that so that they could, um, I feel like, and I, and I'm only speaking from my perspective and mm-hmm. I have a young, young adult, I have two young adults and that's something, you know, I know they're dealing with a lot of um, anxieties, mm-hmm. you know, um, with school and everything and so on and so forth. Um, one of the things um, that I've, you know, talked to them about is tapping and also they are seeing a therapist and it's something that they can do to just get back to reality, you know, um, to, it's sort of like, um, acupuncture yes yeah. like um you know repeating positive things mm-hmm. or bringing them back to reality I, I feel like a lot of people do it to get out that zone sometimes you get stuck but they don't realize that they're doing it and it's just a cool simple way of like reconnecting and and getting back into your body um so that's just one thing I really wanted to share real quickly um thank you for calling on me and this has been really really good thank you so very much and yeah that's dope too the, the mindfulness is dope i do that as well i you know i go into group or one-on-ones i tell them to close their eyes and take their cell phone off i want no energy pulling from you your cell phones pull so much energy from you put everything everything out your pockets you know whatever makes you comfortable and i it's like an affirmation it's like i you know and have them think or breathe or whatever those techniques everything you're right you're right on the money with that i appreciate that i know that helps sister stephanie out as well that mindfulness piece that's another tool thank you absolutely Natalie. that was a great uh suggestion thanks for reminding us of that technique um so thank you all for joining us today for this important topic uh, we as CHWs have an important role to play in the social determinants of health within our youth communities. Um, our uh, presenter Dean has been able to voice that over. And now we hope that you will take action in some way uh, to bring this practice into your own community. And uh, please stay tuned. We will have more capacity building series coming up and join us for our national data webinar tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Dean, do you have any final words? Yeah, so if, if, if anybody, I don't know, wherever you're at, country, world, whatever, I can come to you as well. So that's that's an option as well. I can come to you, uh, we can sit down, we can put it together, we can brainstorm, we can work on the logic model uh, around the EQ side of working with young people, the approaches of working with young people. I'm available. Can you put your email in the chat, please? I got yeah. it. I'm so glad you said that, Brother Dean, because um, truly, you know, you've been doing this work for so, so long. Um, You work across cultures. You've worked with um, very young. You've worked with families. Mm -hmm. You've worked with brothers, sisters, you know, older, younger brothers and sisters, Mm -hmm. uh, gang affiliated, you know, folks jumped in, folks going in and out of prison, um, Mm -hmm. people trying to rebuild their lives right, after a life of um, incarceration or substance use or violence, um, there's a a wealth of information he can share. Um, So Dean has put his email in the chat. We also have your email and you've put lots of great suggestions. So we might also bring Dean back for another training such as this, because a lot of you have been asking. Awesome job. Appreciate you guys. Social sales, we're out. Dean, you've got some amazing uh, comments of gratitude in the chat. So I hope you take a moment to reflect on those. Oh, yeah, and thank yeah. you all for joining us today uh, and spending this hour with us. And we hope to see you back tomorrow. Wonderful. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you for joining us today.